Now it's time to talk about Elvis Presley. Elvis Presley in this first wave of rock and roll, really in the history of rock and roll, but first, certainly in this first wave of rock and roll, this 1950s, second half of the 1950s, is absolutely the most important figure um, there. And it, it's, he's important not only because of his musical contributions, but because of the tremendous success that he had uh, as an artist and as a performer. I mean, Elvis was, in many ways, um, a lot like people before him, like Frank Sinatra and Bing Crosby. Elvis was a song stylist, but he was a fantastically charismatic performer. Uh, the young Elvis was dangerous. He was definitely sort of a, a, a bad guy in a certain kind of a way, um, seen as sort of a, maybe a, a negative influence on young people. I think about, I mention that because a lot of times the Elvis of later years, the Elvis of, of the early 1970s, for example, is not really seen so much that way. But the early Elvis, if you haven't seen those early videos, uh, you should check it out. Uh, anyway, Elvis himself, uh, born in Tupelo, Mississippi, but moved with his family to Memphis when he was about about 13 years old, um, discovered Sam Phillips's Memphis Recording Service, which later became Sun Records in 1952. Uh, Elvis discovered Sam Phillips's uh, Recording Service when he wanted to make um, a, a, a demo tape uh, for his mom's birthday. Um, and so uh, he did that in 1953 and started hanging around the, the, the studio there once Sam Phillips uh, um, uh, started doing Sun Records, established that in 1972, uh, 1952. He'd started out as a guy who basically just recorded concerts and did some radio announcing, that kind of thing. But then he decided, you know, and in fact, he recorded um, a Rocket 88, the, the Jackie Brenston tune, which he then sold or licensed uh, to Chess Records, and they released that in 1951. Well, they got the idea, I should have my own label. So it went from becoming Memphis Recording Service to becoming Sun Records in 1952. Then Elvis comes along, uh, and Elvis finds out that they're there. He's had always, you know, he always wanted to be a singer. He'd listened to a lot of country western music. He'd grown up with a lot of rhythm and blues music. He used to go to the other side of the tracks and try to sneak into clubs and, and hear various kinds of things. He was kind of a, in fact, in, in, in the, the what, mostly white high school that he was, uh, he was in, he was kind of a, a, a loner, you know, um, in some kinds of ways. He was so, so different from the other kids. He was so dedicated to rhythm and blues culture. Anyway, Sam Phillips uh, sees this young Elvis kid coming in. He starts to show up for sessions. Uh, I, there's a story that at one uh, session from the prisoners, he actually tried to offer advice <laughs> about what they should do on one of the tunes. And Sam Phillips, the way he told the story, said, I, mean, I didn't think that was maybe the best environment for a kid his age to be hanging around in, so I tried to scare him off. Anyway, Elvis kept coming back and kept, kept wanting to record for Sam Phillips. And so finally, Sam decided to start working with Elvis. Uh, he did a couple of tunes for him. Uh, uh, in the studio at Sun in 1954, and Sam uh didn't think he could use either of those, but he saw some kind of promise in Elvis Presley. Uh, and so he put him together with Scotty Moore um, and Bill Black, two more experienced musicians who he trusted to kind of work with Elvis to do a bunch of different kinds of things. He really wasn't quite sure uh, what Elvis could do well. Sam Phillips had, uh, from the time he started Sun Records until the time uh, he started to have success with Elvis Presley, which would have been 52, 53, into 1954, he'd always recorded black artists. But understanding that crossover was an important component of of being able to sell those records, crossing over the R&B records, crossing over to a white audience. He'd always said famously, uh, if I could find a black guy, or if I could find a white guy that could sing like a black guy, I could make a million dollars. Well, it turned out Elvis Presley was that guy. But even Sam didn't know it at the beginning. So when Elvis came back with Scotty and, uh, and, and Bill, and th they were doing all kinds of tunes, they were, a lot of them were sort of almost like Dean Martin-ish kinds of sort of crooner songs. And they did a whole session of that kind of thing, and things were not going well. Uh, everybody was getting tired. Um, you know, they were getting a little bit sort of punch drunk. And uh, the way the story is often told, Sam Phillips had to fix something having to do with his, his recording equipment, had to you know, go underneath the, the equipment and fix some wires or some kind of thing. And so the guys had a little bit of time on their hands and they were kind of clowning around. And Elvis always used to like to clown around. And so he starts to do this That's All Right Mama thing, this Arthur Craddock tune that he knew. And he starts to sort of do it. And the other guys thinking it was kind of funny, sort of you know, join in. And they start to do it all just as a kind of a gag to amuse themselves while they're waiting for Sam to finish playing with the, uh, uh, the equipment. And uh, as the story goes, Sam Phillips has had pops up and he says, what's that? And he says, oh, it's just nothing. We're just fooling around. Well, let's record it. 
And so they record, That's All Right Mama, and of course, wouldn't you know it, that becomes the song that in 1954, the summer of 1954, that becomes the defining record for Elvis Presley uh, in his career, at least the first, the first big one. It's got that, that Sun Records sound, that slapback echo that, that Sam Phillips uh, was so famous for. And in many ways, it's kind of an, it's like Elvis is taking country music. It's, it's what the Arthur Craddock, who was an, uh, an R&B singer, it's what the Arthur Craddock song would have sounded like if it was done by country western musicians. The flip side of the record is Bill Monroe's uh, Blue Moon of Kentucky done as if it were an R&B tune. So it's interesting that, that we, we've got an R&B tune done as if it was a country tune and a country tune or a bluegrass tune done as if it was an R&B tune. So if you're looking for, a, for someone who was able to put those styles together, there it is uh, on, on the A and B side of that, of that single from 1954. Well, after he made that record, um, uh, Sam Phillips uh, immediately took it out to his friend Dewey Phillips, no relation, uh, the, not brothers or family members, but they just happen to have the same last name. Dewey Phillips, who was, we said before, had the radio show at WHBQ, and Dewey Phillips starts to play it over and over again. Well, the song catches on, and so Sam Phillips has got a regional hit on his hands, and on the strength of that regional hit, uh, he's able to get Elvis on the Grand Ole Opry and get him a regular spot on Louisiana Hayride. It's interesting that that, that two-sided single some of, the, some of the markets preferred to play Blue Moon of Kentucky. Other markets preferred to play That's All Right Mama, depending on whether they saw Elvis as primarily a kind of a hip country act or a countryish R&B act, right? But both sides uh, got airplay depending on, on the region. But anyway, he started to have some, some, some pretty good success with it. Things were starting to heat up. This Elvis Presley guy is uh, looking like he could be a, a big star. And in walks a guy by the name of, Car of uh, Colonel Tom Parker, who, who had previously managed Hank Snow, a country and western singer that had had a certain amount of success. And uh, Parker sees something in Elvis Presley and starts to broker a deal to uh, take over the management of Elvis Presley and get him signed to RCA Records. And so they, and this isn't the first time somebody had uh, asked Sam Phillips to sell Elvis's contract, but uh, Tom Parker brokers this deal for what at the time seemed like an enormous amount of money. He brokered a deal to sell the Sun contract to RCA for $35,000, plus Elvis would get $5,000 in back royalties that he was owed for, that hadn't been paid yet on records that had already been sold. So $40,000 total. It seemed like, uh, uh, to a lot of people in the industry, like RCA was throwing its money away on one of these uh, idiotic rock and roll singers who were just the flavor of the month, and boy, would they ever regret it. Uh, but the, the deal was done. It's important to point out, it was the first the first time one of these rock and roll singers had signed with a major label. So that was already an indication that rock and roll was coming up in the world, uh, out of the indie label into a major label with all the resources at their disposal. But it's also important to point out that uh, Elvis was signed to the country division of RCA, and so his recordings were done at Nashville. So it's not like he was entirely in the mainstream, even uh, within RCA. But it was a crucial step for rock and roll, and because he was now with this major label, they were able to get him television appearances. So he appears uh, in early 1956 on the Dorsey Brothers show a few times, although that, that show did not have very good ratings. He appeared a couple times on the Milton Berle show, which did get very good rating, uh, ratings and was extremely controversial, and then a couple of times on the Steve Allen show uh, where it was controversial, one of them where he even comes out wearing a tuxedo and sings Hound Dog to a Hound Dog uh, to try and make make up for the controversial things that he'd done before, which included getting to the end of uh, uh, Hound Dog on one of these performances and going into a kind of almost stripper bump and grind kind of thing at the end. It totally impromptu. If you see the clip of that, you can see Scotty, Bill, and the drummer, DJ Fontana, looking at each other saying to themselves, what in the heck is this guy doing? Live TV, and all of a sudden he goes into this ending we haven't rehearsed, and he was really playing it up, and the girls were screaming and all this kind of thing, and the next day it was like, oh, Elvis the pelvis, this is sinful, you know, hell and perdition. And so Elvis was now the bad, the, the bad boy who was leading all these, these kids um, astray and all that. So then uh, he came back uh, the next performance and did this thing where he was wearing a tuxedo and saying hound dog in this very sort of proper way as a kind of a tongue-in-cheek uh, kind of thing. Anyway. Elvis Presley, very, very big. One of the important things about his success was that he not only had crossover success, but he was one of the first artists to repeatedly 
have top hits on all three charts at the same time. I remember the figures that I cited uh, in one of the earlier lectures about how separated the charts were in the period of the first half of the 50s. Now we're talking about hit records that are, in the case of records like Hound Dog and Jailhouse Rock, were number one on all three charts at the same time. Imagine that. That's what you call market saturation. And so this, this tremendous um, you know, charisma, television presence, all this kind of thing really sent all kinds of ripples through the uh, pop and music business that RCA, a major label, had gotten involved. This guy was on TV. He was having fantastic hits. He was a star. He was a celebrity. And all of a sudden, the other labels started thinking, we need to get into this game, too. And all of a sudden, the rock business started to go up a couple levels in terms of, of, of big sort of major label and corporate interest. Now, we think about Elvis as a performer. We should, we should view him, as I said before, as a song stylist. Elvis never wrote any songs. We talk about uh, Chuck Berry writing his own music, Buddy Holly writing his own music. But most of these guys didn't write their own songs at this time, and Elvis was one of those. What he knew how to do was how to choose tunes that were best for him. And a typical Elvis recording session, uh, we, knew this, we know this from various accounts, including those of Jerry Lieber and Mike Stoller, um, who were there, had him going through song after song after song with the band until he found something that he thought fit him just right. He had a, a lot of idea about what he did well. The deal he made with Colonel Tom Parker is he would, he would stay out of the business end of that and Colonel Tom Parker would do that and Colonel Tom Parker would stay out of the music end. And if he recorded something that he didn't want released, it wouldn't be released. Elvis was the uh, final arbiter of what happened musically speaking. And I think that, that maybe defeats the image of Elvis as just being kind of a dumb dumb but attractive and talented singer. He really understood his own talents, his own music, his own approach. Uh, he blended together pop, country, western, and R&B singing styles. You can hear an awful lot of Dean Martin, for example, and Elvis with that hoba 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 thing that he does. Uh, you can hear an awful lot of R&B. Clyde McFadder and the Drifters, for example, if you take the, uh, the original Clyde McFadder and the Drifters recording of White Christmas and then listen to the version of White Christmas that Elvis does on his Christmas album from a couple years later, you can hear Elvis doing that version but doing all the different voices of the drifters in succession as they sing it in his own way, absolutely imitating them. And a lot of things he does sound very Elvis-like, which give us, gives us a sense of where he got a lot of the things that he blended together to create his unique vocal style. Remember, as a song stylist, that's what you want, a unique vocal style, and Elvis Presley certainly had that. Well, by 1958, Elvis had been drafted into the Army. Uh, March of 1958, on a day that everybody thought was Black Monday, Elvis Presley was inducted into the armed services and was away for a couple of years. But Elvis's success opened up opportunity for other rock and roll artists, so let's turn our attention to them in the next lecture.